Just up top, I think it's imperative to go forward listening to this podcast with the understanding that upon recording this podcast, Todd and I had not had lunch yet. And I think if you know me, you know that I can't really function without lunch. There's a wall in Madagascar that says, if she's mad, give her a biscuit, which were kind of instructions on how to operate me. So throughout this podcast, I'm jumbling up words. I can't really speak. Todd is mixing up the names, but uh, Roxanne has lovingly added the perspective that she (laughs) appreciates keeping this in as a fight against perfectionism, which I think we all need in the conservation industry. We all need to be reminded that we don't have to be perfect all the time. So here is a very imperfect conversation um, of Todd and I before lunchtime and some insights from both Annabelle and Roxanne. So yeah, I think both of them for their patience and understanding with us throughout this episode, but I also can't wait to get into it with you. So without further ado, let's get into the episode. Hello and welcome to episode, well technically episode two, but like it's topic one of how to conserve conservationist season two all about you my name is jesse and i'm here with todd that was an amazing intro <laughs> rolls off the tongue why do you always leave a huge pause it's like i am jesse yay and you're like one two three todd <laughs> i'm just <laughs> playing off your excellent timing just saying the intro <laughs> i thought that's the tone we're going for or whatever (laughs) this episode is all about chronic illness which i'm actually very excited to talk about and i've wanted to talk about for so long because i've had two people speak up and write blogs about chronic illness their names are roxanne and annabelle and every time that well both times that they (laughs) have come um to talk about chronic illness and submit it in a blog they have asked to be kept anonymous if you look Um, Annabelle's picture is of a little marsupial and Roxanne has her back to the camera and they don't have their last names or links to any social media and for that reason you can kind of tell that they want their anonymity anonymity (laughs) they want to be anonymous they want their privacy they want their privacy which means that it's actually something that I feel like I can do for them like to have this conversation what is wrong with me today (laughs) have this conversation um and I can have a voice for them or give them a voice because in both instances, they haven't wanted to reveal their true identity, which means chronic Ill- people with chronic illness are like superheroes. We'll try to have a voice to them, but their voice may be all over the place and mispronouncing <laughs> words. <laughs> I really apologize for my words. It's just before lunchtime. I should have done this after lunch when the food corrects my tone and my words. <laughs> but nonetheless, let's power on. <laughs> So we have um, our two amazing blogs by Annabelle and Roxanne. You can find them both on the Lonely Conservationist website. Um, and I'll link both the blogs in the show notes so you can follow along with us. We have show notes. I'll add. Fancy. I'll just have a show note. I'll just invent one for myself. Okay. No, we have a little bio of what the what's this episode about. Don't worry. You'll see later. <laughs> You can tell that Todd was a really a- avid listener of our other yeah. episodes. Very shocked about I the features we the have. Podcast quite often. Yeah, so this is a really good example of why this podcast um, is a good format without guests. Because even if we wanted to have Roxanne and Annabelle on to talk about chronic illness in conservation, I don't know how willing they would be to attach their voice to it. And it's interesting because. I didn't, from someone who doesn't have a chronic illness, it's really challenging for me to understand how something you're born with and how something that you're, is just a part of you can make it so scary to be so upfront with employers and so open and honest because I've never had to hide any parts of my health or any parts of my body to be more employable, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's it's a pretty messed up dynamic that they both get into with like, even if outside of conservation, it's a problem for people getting work. Yeah. Because, yeah, you can, 
it's an understandable fear because if you're the employer and you say, oh, you can work here, but, you know, you have this uh, disability or you know problem that stops you from doing as much work as other people, you, you can understand the employer going, ugh. <laughs> yeah, like, should I choose someone that's more able to do everything? And we know how competitive conservation is in getting jobs already. So we're trying, like, the whole first podcast season talked about the problems of trying to be so perfect to get the like three jobs that are, that are yeah available. and it's already like a hyper competitive yeah industry anyway and i know like most countries would have protections against um disabilities yeah but it probably gets a lot more murky with someone with like a chronic illness or like a bit more of a gray area yeah because chronic means it's not going away like you have to live your whole life with this it's not like you can say to your employer oh i'll get better you know like in monty python where it's like bring out your dead i'm not dead yet i'm getting better (laughs) (laughs) you can't say that to an employer um it's something that they have to know that is going to be something that they'll have to accommodate yeah forever i think another fear employers will have would be if you have this chronic uh, medical issue and you do this job with them, what if it gets worse because you're doing the job mm-hmm. and then, like, they'll, well, you, they'll be scared that you're going to sue them for, like, injuring you further when actually it's, like, whose fault is it? Yeah. It's it's pretty messed up. Like, ideally, everyone's just open and honest with each other, but I definitely sympathise yeah if not being sure well so we'll start off by talking about what kinds of pain they both feel and so annabelle doesn't name a specific um illness whereas roxanne does so i'll talk about a bit about the symptoms so annabelle says my pain started for some unknown reason just before my final year of high school university is considered the most important and stressful oh wait i read that so wrong (laughs) (laughs) her pain started just before um her final year of high school which is considered the most important and stressful year before she goes to university so the strain of that year on her nerves and muscles caused constant arm pain and doing simple tasks like writing or holding a book open was too unbearable for her like her muscles were so fatigued it was hard to even just sit up or open a book. Um, She says, some days I couldn't even brush my teeth or button my shirt without searing pain racing through my arms, yet every doctor said it would naturally heal because I was so young. But instead of healing my pain, the long period of rest just deconditioned her muscles. So starting university with muscles that could not weather or strain or... Wait. (laughs) She started universities with muscles that could not weather the strain of study and a nervous system that was wired to fire pain signals. So her doctor said she was young, she would recover, she just needed to rest, and she took the time to rest, but that just made her muscles weaker because they weren't used to, or they didn't have that strength build up. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like at the time she didn't really have a precise medical diagnosis of what was wrong mm. apart from my arms hurt a lot like more than they should yeah and doctors just being like oh just don't worry about it that really reminds me of someone i knew with chronic fatigue and she couldn't do school because just the act of sitting in a chair for eight hours was just too much for her i mean it's too much for most people let's be honest yeah but i don't it was think, a real problem I don't think that's, that's why like, lies with yeah <laughs> that's the problem you go to the doctor and you say you know, just sit in a chair, it's just it's so exhausting. And the doctor just having sort of my response of being like, yeah, <laughs> that's not a problem. Are not like that. They but, are though. But you can imagine, right, if conservation is such, a lot of entry level jobs are like when I did my restoration job, a lot of people do bush crew where you're out weeding or planting or using chainsaws or going to remote field sites. If you can't even open a book, How are you supposed to go and do these entry-level jobs in the field? I mean, I have nothing but the utmost sympathy for Roxanne. That was Annabelle. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) I care a lot about you, Annabelle, I promise. That sounds like it sucks a lot. I remember in Annabelle's blog, she also talked about how she couldn't write notes, so she ended up using voice memos and using other tactics, but she did end up passing school and getting into a university course, which Which is is pretty crazy to me. Yeah. I'm just so impressed that, like, 
when your muscles are so fatigued and you're in so much pain but you're so driven to still be in the career and still be in conservation and you put in that much effort to get to where you want to go it's just i have the utmost respect for you yeah um so roxanne actually, i can't i'll go on <laughs> i can't help it as a as a man i want to fix the problems that people present me with and i i feel so bad for her like just struggling to write because mm-hmm. her arms are so much pain but there's like you know now nowadays i don't know sure there's a long time ago and nowadays you have like the Google voice keyboard stuff, mm-hmm. which is honestly not as good and useful. But there are like more complicated versions that are useful that I know like, you know, paralyzed people use. Yeah. And like surely if you talk to the university and be like, listen, my arms have a problem, you know, can I uh, write the exam with my voice? With dictation or something? Yeah. Like surely they would try to help you. How but accessible like, are these technologies? Like Not very, right? Yeah. Because, like, everyone's phone has audio messages or, like, I think everyone's Word documents, you can speak and it types it. Yeah. Everyone has access to, like, the basic stuff that helps, like, normal people mm-hmm. get little bits done. But if you're going to, like, totally rely on your voice to control a computer, you need, like, some more fancy, expensive software. Yeah. Which is understandable. And we all know, conservationists aren't the richest of people. That's fair. So how can we afford fancy dictating software? So it might <laughs> it just might be another barrier. Yeah, and then you're limited to your laptop and it's like, hey, can I use my laptop with the software in the exam? And the university might be like, ah, uh, no. can you just not? <laughs> you best believe Annabelle came in with some answers for us. So she said... Both university and school offered exams to be taken with a scribe, but not a computer aid. Scribes are generally another student who you speak your answers to and they write your exam. I chose not to use a scribe because it is actually quite a difficult skill to learn and I'd rather just put up with the pain. Working with a scribe means you tend to be slower due to the communication. You need to have your sentences formulated before you say them. You need a good working relationship with your scribe to be for it to be any bit competitive with an able-bodied student. I didn't think it was worth it for me, so instead I took the extra time for my exams, usually for rest breaks. Rest breaks only give you five extra minutes for every 30 to 60 minutes of writing. And when an exam ri- and when exam writing, and the wonderful stress and muscular tension that goes with it is painful, it doesn't give you that much of an advantage. And she says, yes, there is software that writes for you. The best is Dragon Software, which I got through my university disability provisions in the second year of university. It took over a year for her to get permanent disability provisions. Yay, insensitive doctors and chronic pain. So Todd, you are right. Doctors are insensitive. Um, Dragon is pretty good, she says, but it is slower than typing. You have to think of the full sentence before you speak. And it uses the words around to accurately predict what the word actually was, if that makes sense. You can't say, um, uh, and it sometimes struggles with the Australian accents. Yeah, I feel that too. (laughs) Despite the fact that you train it to understand your speaking style. She says, I once did a zoology report where I wrote the word mate and mating a lot and it could not understand me. If I had essays or reports, I could use Dragon, but not Excel work, chemical or mathematical conditions and formulas. Um, So, as you can understand in science, if you're doing statistics, if you're doing a lot of like scientific work, a lot of it is in Excel. So that would be extremely difficult not to use uh, this software with. And she says at the end, my management mostly looks like strengthening the other muscles in my arms and shoulders to compensate for chronic weakness, symptomatic relief in in remedial massage and psychological techniques to assist in the management of pain. I also try to avoid repetitive tasks, i.e. I can't type, write, carry things for hours on end and she needs variability in her work. So for those of you who are employers and you think you may have some Uh, employees who have chronic pain. These are some things you can help them with. Um, Variability in work, avoiding repetitive tasks, and maybe not data management and data entry. So yeah, thank you for that, Annabelle. Back to the episode. Um, So Roxanne actually has a name for her um, illness. She says, I was seriously ill with a Chiari malformation. 
I think it's Kayari. Let's look at it. Kiari. Kiari. Sorry, my bad. Um, this is this is why it's important to look at these blogs because then you can learn. This the is correct... how little we know about these yeah, things. Yeah, we can learn the correct pronunciation. I was seriously ill with a Kiari malformation, a rare congenital defect of the skull compressing the cerebellum and brainstem into the spinal canal. The statistics are unclear, but it typically occurs in one out of 1,000 births. The condition restricts the flow of spinal fluid and impacts the automatic functions for life, such as breathing, temperature regulation, motor control, and swallowing. An excess of spinal fluid in the brain, uh, a tethered spinal cord, and a spinal cord uh, shrinks or cyst also develops in patients. Brain stem decompression, spinal cord, and shunt insertion surgeries until the age of five prevented significant brain damage, severe disability, and other life-threatening conditions. After my last MRI at 11, I haven't received specialist treatment as I simply had had enough, it, had enough of it all. I was stable, and if anything, any more procedures would have been counterproductive. What remains is the cyst, as it was too complex and risky to treat. Because of that, other residuals. Because of that and other residual symptoms, I have a low fitness level and problems with balance and coordination, traversing over loop, loose rocks and steep rises. Sorry, my reading is really. You do abysmal. this thing where you have the text in front of you and you say something different. Yeah. So Todd noticed this way before Even... I've done this podcast. <laughs> so Todd will ask me like, "Hey, I just wrote a report for work. Can you see if it makes sense?" And he will see me make up the sentences yeah. as I'm reading you it. You read the sentence and be like, actually, how I would say it is differently, and you say it how you would say it instead. And then the rest of the sentence doesn't make sense because I haven't accounted for, like... <laughs> you, no, what bit. shocks me is you do this for your own writing. How did I you write, write a your book, own book that makes And you'd sense. read it again now to me, and you say a different sentence. <laughs> well, how do I know that, like, what I wrote actually made sense if I kept saying other stuff? That's what's yeah. bewildering. That's why I've never read the book again. Because <laughs> after the first chapter, I was like, oh, God, what did I write? <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Um, Not to take focus away from Roxanne. Yeah, so sorry, Annabelle and Roxanne, if I accidentally butcher your blogs with this weird thing that I do that I didn't know I did. Until very recently. <laughs> um, so, what I remember about Roxanne's blog standing out to me is that so she was able to do field work and she actually liked and wanted to do field work. It's a very important part of conservation and what she was passionate about. Mm. But there was this you feel like an inconvenience when you say, like, look, I can do some field sites, but not all of them. So, if I commit to this job, I will have to assess the fieldwork on a case-by-case basis and it kind of seems weird for an employer if you are just picking and choosing the work that you do especially if you've kept your chronic illness a secret just it might look like you're a bit I don't know like pedantic or lazy having a it's so did you do any extra research on this condition no but yeah having like your I didn't either (laughs) but it sounds like uh yeah like having problems with balance and just like Mm -hmm. having full control of your body like she can drive she can walk around a flat office yeah it's like she could have a relatively pretty normal life Mm -hmm. but because she's like i want to do conservation and like go out in the sticks yeah that's like that's for the average person even of average fitness that might be fairly stressful yeah because there's times in my career that i've had to scale like rock faces where there's like a river underneath or I've had to climb mountains or I've had to like work on really tight ledges I have had to just plant trees or weed or like remove olive trees or get data from all these obscure places and I totally understand because there was this one time I was in Malaysia and I okay when you go to the tropics it takes you like a week minimum to get used to the humidity and like your body takes a while to adjust So I was like fresh off the plane, like two days in, I caught a boat out to the field site and it was really hot, really humid. And I just, even though it was a hill, I usually would be able to walk. I was like, can I please just wait for you down here? Cause I knew that with the humidity and everything, I was feeling lightheaded. My body was just not used to it. And I felt kind of ashamed to be like, 
like I physically am unable to do this right now can I just wait for you because yeah. with all the pressures of conservation having to be like perfect all the time and fit and able just admitting that you just it will be better to sit this one out if like and that was just one time for me imagine if your whole life you'd have to make these decisions of when you could and couldn't participate in something yeah it's it sucks yeah it sucks <laughs> and it's, yeah it's a whole other problem that you could you can you can sympathize with but you haven't had an impact your life too much yeah and what's craziest so in annabelle's blog she said one in five people experience a chronic pain condition and yet it was only added to the medical diagnostics bible the international classification of diseases in 2019 from this statistic it must be a factor that so many conservationists are facing because if it's one in five people, like if one mm. in five people have a chronic illness and everyone is too afraid to talk and everyone wants to be anonymous to talk about it, it means that this must be such a huge problem for people and so many people must be experiencing it, but there's just no awareness of being in conservation with chronic illness. And I know for a fact, there's more people in the community that have chronic illness that haven't shared their story and they've been in the community from the beginning. Mm. So I just want you to know if you have chronic illness in conservation, you are a hundred percent not alone. You're one in five people. Like, yeah, it's, I, it's a very normal thing yeah. to have. So I feel like this is why I really wanted to talk about it in an episode is because I, I just want, I can never make you feel safe enough to talk about it with your employers or to talk about it publicly because I understand the fear and I understand that all the restrictions that you must feel like we already feel the restrictions to getting a job there's already this like mentality you have to be perfect to get a job in conservation and you must be feeling it like 500 times more with the restrictions that you need to have to keep yourself safe and healthy and it's just I hope that even by doing this podcast, there's some employers out there who disclose at the beginning, like, if you have an illness, please feel comfortable telling to me, we can accommodate you. And imagine if employers were like set up front that they're willing to accommodate different abilities. Like, how cool would that be? Well, that's what I was trying to say. I, I, it depends on what country you're in. But legally, I think in a lot of countries, they have to accommodate like people's disabilities at least mm -hmm. wasn't it in annabelle's blog she thought she had to disclose it and she did and the employer told her yeah that the employer made it sound like you better tell us the truth or you know we'll get mad and fire you but actually like legally technically she doesn't have to tell them it's the same as like if you do an application and they ask you like oh what's your gender and what's your uh back uh, ethnic background mm -hmm. like they might they might say that with like good intentions of like trying to see who's applying and yeah. make sure they have a diverse but it also like now they know yeah <laughs> and they that you know it could, could impact their decision so legally you don't have to tell them if, as polite as they act as if oh just let us know oh you know we all want to be on the same page sometimes you are better off just blending in yeah yeah because it's like, I hear from people who talk about it from a racism or a sexism standpoint that sometimes they don't know if they got the job because they really were the best person for the job or if they're trying to feel like a diversity quota. That's a pretty awful feeling to have. Yeah, so they don't even know if they are the best candidate for the role and if they're just like a pity selection. Yeah. Which... I don't know if people had more openness, like if diversity, true diversity included accessibility would, and they had to feel like an accessibility quota, you're at risk of having those same things happening in, in this instance as well, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's a problem with diversity. It's like, I feel like now diversity is only extent in Australia is mainly to do with, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and women mm. and where's the diversity for accessibility because I yeah. feel like Annabelle and Roxanne both have jobs they're both able to do amazing work they're knowledgeable and in fact they would have gone the extra yards to make sure that they have the knowledge and skills like they could have easily been like oh it's too hard let's drop out of uni let's drop out of school 
but they persevered, which means they have that extra determination and that flexibility to get things done in maybe a non-conventional way, which I think is really useful. Yeah. So I feel like we should now be extending diversity to accessibility as well. And a step that I've recently taken from somebody who suggested this was to make my uh, Instagram post on lonely conservationists more like to have the caption at the like the closed caption at the bottom. So if you can't see, you can read the text, and then at the bottom it says, "This is a photo of Todd standing in a red um, Conservation Asia shirt and blue dinosaur shorts." Like, <laughs> <laughs> and then people who who can't see know what the picture is of yeah i was gonna say like in my technology knowledge it's it's a kind of thing where it's a little bit of extra work Mm -hmm. to like help people who are blind or like need help interacting with computer yeah but like it's so worth it yeah it goes such a long way it helps people so much just to do like a little bit of extra work and another concept i've heard is like um if you make stuff not even to technology, but just anything more accessible to more people, different abilities. Mm -hmm. It makes it easier for everyone. Yeah. (laughs) Like, I'm just thinking of, um, I keep getting mixed up their names. Annabelle with the arm pants. You know, she, she might not be able to type doing data entry Mm -hmm. on a keyboard for eight hours straight in a day. But, like, most people probably shouldn't be doing that. And, they would, like, yeah, anyway, a normal person would yeah. have a, a tired arm. So, like, maybe it should be just, like, much more normalized to be like, okay, every half an hour you have a break mm. and, like, take it easy and make that just the norm. Yeah. So when Roxanne comes in and says, my arms hurt. Annabelle. When Annabelle comes in <laughs> <laughs> and says... They're b- are they both made up names anyway? No. What? They're their actual names. It's just their first names. I thought names. they were anonymous. Yeah. Well, anono- it's more anonymous than the rest. So <laughs> usually the blogs will have your first and last name and link to your social medias. This okay. is just their first name. Okay. You can't really tell who someone is. Well, you, you could if you like really if wanted If you knew to. them. <laughs> if you knew them. So, yeah, if you, if you make the workplace more forgiving. Yeah. For that sort of... And then like... You can take that, like, to everywhere, you know. Having a footpath where Mm -hmm. you have a little dip for people with wheelchairs. Yeah. Well, that just makes it easier for anyone walking to get on and off the footpath as well. Like, it's good for everyone. Yeah, and also, this makes me think about... So, Spencer, one of the Lonely Conservationists, and also the host for the Lonely Conversationist discussions and workshops, was saying that um, in university, in his, like, master's program or PhD program, in both... He, he did it in two different countries and in both universities in both countries they told the students how to like get through the day in an unhealthy way like <laughs> you should have naps here naps here naps here like instead of making the workload more accessible and making the course accessible they taught people how they should be eating and sleeping to to accommodate the unhealthy yeah workload I've, d- I've met people who are like, oh, what? You sleep for more than five hours a night? You must be some kind of slack, lazy <laughs> slob. It's like, what? No, like, some people do need more than five hours. Yeah, and in like, fact, everybody around. needs more than five hours of sleep. And this is what I'm saying. Like, the, it must be so hard if you have a chronic illness because how academia and everything is set up, it's already set up to destroy the mental and physical health and well-being of like normal abled people Mm. like able-bodied people like who don't have chronic illnesses it's already set up to reduce your sleep reduce your like capacity to function outside of just getting the study done i know my body was destroyed by my university's drinking culture (laughs) yeah well i don't think this is the same thing you've never done like a uh, like a an honors or a master's or a PhD, which requires like eighty hours a week of research and field work and teaching and everything you have to do on the side. Yeah. So it's like really ridiculous that they're like, this is how you nap effectively. This is how you <laughs> like. Here's how you take a really good five minute nap instead of being like, um, let's make the work load a reasonable time. Yeah, let's make the workload something that's like shorter 
and less intense, but it's more effective. Because I feel like I could learn the things I did in uni in a shorter, t- like shorter, more effective time. Like, because you don't retain every single thing that you learn in lectures. No. You just learn the stuff that's applicable to tangible activities or actual things that you have to do. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, what I guess I'm saying is I feel like it would be really great and progressive in conservation to have a more health conscious workspace for everyone. Like, because the amount of times that I've pushed myself beyond what is normal or what is healthy for like to just keep up with the job if it's hard for me it's going to be harder for so many other people and i feel like we shouldn't it's you shouldn't be successful if you're burnt out or if you're overworked or if you work you're sleeping five hours a day or if you have no time for yourself like why is that a measure of success you should be frowned upon for this (laughs) (laughs) so yeah and this is what i was I also wrote down that I was really struck by Annabelle talking about losing herself and having her basic abilities taken away like she was a lesser version of herself and she even considered herself to be stripped of her values and dreams because imagine if you you were able-bodied and all of a sudden you can't sit up for a long amount of time, you can't hold a book, you can't write notes, all the things that came very normally to you you took for granted yeah certainly. you took for granted it was stripped away and you don't feel like yourself anymore and i really held on to this because i talk so much in lonely conservationists about how conservationists don't value themselves this is like a baseline imagine if you couldn't even do half the stuff that your other conservationist colleagues are doing like they don't value themselves already imagine like this level of feeling like you've lost yourself and not valuing yourself like it just makes me so sad that because of how like cutthroat and unaccommodating the industry is it makes you feel like you're worthless and you don't belong here when imposter syndrome and not being valued is already so rife and people who are very able-bodied already feel like they can't get a job and that they're not welcome in the industry makes it rough it's tough i really really i like it just makes me reflect on myself as well because i spend like a whole book a whole first season of the the podcast saying like i i've not like i didn't value myself in conservation how could i if nobody's paying me i felt like i didn't belong at all these conferences people treating me like this but i could still perform roles i could still like i still had myself and my abilities to be like to fall back on like if I wanted to go volunteer or climb a mountain or like do something to make myself feel better I still had my own abilities so I just really empathize I can't empathize because I haven't been there myself but I really sympathize with Annabelle for feeling like she had just lost herself but I'm also in the same respect so proud of her for coming out of that and for writing this blog and for kind of owning herself and to taking the time to show representation for other people and what people like Annabelle and Roxanne are going through. And I think that's really brave and important to switch it around from like, I'm worthless, I have no value, to like, look, I'm going through this, probably so many other people are going through this, let's make a space for ourselves. Do you think she would be able to like flip it around and have the mindset of, You know, despite this limitation, I was able to achieve as good as everyone else and possibly better and would make her feel like supremely confident in her abilities. I don't know if people... Probably not, but that's definitely a mindset you you could take. Yeah, because literally from my from my personal experiences it's taken me like very weird isolated situations to kind of have that point of view when you're caught up in the day-to-day it's Mm. it's challenging to get that mindset you don't sit down every day and reflect on everything you've achieved in life yeah and be proud of it but i really this is why i really wanted to highlight these stories because i'm so proud of annabelle and roxanne for making it in the industry which is something I haven't even been able to do. (laughs) But but they both have chronic illnesses. I'm just so impressed and so, like, amazed. I mean, fair to say, they're just better human beings than you. (laughs) Objectively, Um, they are. (laughs) Like, 
And I, it breaks my heart that they feel like they have no value or that they've lost themselves and that they're worthless because of how much they have been able to do. And in it's like the pandemic when you say, like, if you achieved anything in 2020, it was amazing. Like, a lot of people, if they got all their primary functions taken away from them, wouldn't have been able to do anything. And it would be so easy to give up. So the fact that they both persevered in the industry and both got to where they are today is amazing and i see roxanne email me and she has her like work um like you know how you have your work signature yeah. and i'm like oh she has an actual job <laughs> like i'm so jealous of her <laughs> you haven't got a work signature <laughs> yeah one day maybe i have a work signature but it's just like so incredible that both of these girls sorry women have been able to take adversity grow and build themselves up into such an amazing space and then be brave enough despite all the pressure about chronic illness and the stigmas and everything tell their story and make a space for people like them and acknowledge that one in five people have a chronic illness like what the hell like this is something so many people should be talking about even if they do have to stay anonymous I just feel like what they've both done is just so incredible and I'm very proud Agreed. of them. Yeah, totally. I feel very 100%. maternal. Maternal. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I guess, like, we've talked about this briefly, but I think it needs to be rehashed is, like, a lot of the pathways for people in conservation go from, like, you do your uni, you get, like, a bush crew job, very physical work, and then you might go to an office job where you might be doing more grant writing or policy or whatever. Would you say, at least in the conservation industry, like having a cushy office job is seen as something you need to work towards? Well, this is the problem for a lot of able-bodied people is they get into conservation for the field work and the higher up they get, the more in the office they are. It yeah, happened to and my they actually f- don't like that. Yeah, that happened to my friend who works uh, for Pugs, for a parks. I think I shouldn't say work which, for a park. which national park they work for. But basically, like they got into conservation to be out in the field and the, they got promoted and got promoted and promoted and now he's in an office by himself dealing with bureaucracy <laughs> filling out forms filling out permits. forms dealing with like people who are being assholes <laughs> <laughs> because like the higher you get the less you're doing stuff you actually care about so like office jobs will be good if you want to stay in an office and like it's a space to occupy but i actually don't know what a first initial stepping stone would be for someone that's not really bush crew because i know conservation is so diverse right and there's so many different fields you could get into but a lot of the entry-level jobs i can think of are all really physical jobs so i wonder how challenging it is if you have chronic illness and you want to bypass the field work altogether because you're just not able I wonder how challenging it is then to try and go straight into an office job or straight into like an education job or something that's not out in the field. The answer may appear to be fairly challenging, but not impossible. Yeah. Well, I guess that's everything, right? (laughs) (laughs) If you put enough time and effort and energy into something, you can probably get far, whatever you want. But it's like... If you believe in yourself, you can do anything. (laughs) You can do anything. Yeah, it's just so interesting to, like, think about if I had a chronic illness, how much of my conservation career would I have to just erase from my life? Mm. I've done, like, four years of bush crew, and then my honours was in Indonesia, where I just walked for 12 hours a day. And it's just crazy, like not being able to do that I understand feeling like you would lose yourself a bit so for instance all I wanted to do was go into orangutan conservation if I found out the year before I went to do my honours that I couldn't walk through the forest anymore and I just had to um, have my field staff do it it would kill me it would be so depressing because I kind of had a taste for that when they wouldn't give me my permits and I couldn't go into the field because I just didn't have permits. Yeah. And I was so miserable because I was like, why am I even here? The only reason I want to be here is to be in the field. Yeah. So it's just so crushing that, like, especially in Annabelle's case, like she had abilities and they just got taken away from her. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's rough. So. I mean, nothing but the utmost sympathies and respect. Yeah. I guess, like, I think it would be good for us to think about ways to make um, a conservation career more accessible from a friends and family point of view, from a colleague point of view, and from, like, an industry point of view. So we've mm-hmm. already touched on having like globally in your company uh what are they called like practices that just make it accessible for all people to work (laughs) yeah that's what i mean like a lot of the changes need to make just make it better for everyone yeah better for everyone because then also it doesn't isolate the person with the chronic illness and it doesn't put in the like put them in a pedestal and say like haha you're different yeah if you're out doing field work whether you have like a medical condition that makes you take a break every half an hour or if you're like me and just a lazy slob who lives on the couch and, and that causes harder. you to need to have a break every half an hour as well like it's it's good and like useful to everyone yeah so in a like a gym class and you're not I do, letting the team down in a gym class i do they're just like always if you need to regress into a like an easier exercise feel free to do it if you need to stop take a rate you do it like you are paying money to be here make mm. what you want out of it and i wish that's what jobs were like because i know they have like jobs have an output like they have something they need to achieve to they get do need money. to get the work done but We have seen from Pixar and Apple and Google, the more autonomy you give people, the better outputs you usually get. Like if you give them space to rest or creative areas or they can decorate their desk how they want it to be. Like the more freedom you give people to own the space, the more gets done anyway. Like if you take autonomy away and people are just slave driving, you're not going to get as as good outputs from your business. Yeah, but... But what? It's hard to tell them that. <laughs> I think the problem is, right, so there is actually a study. I can't think of the name of the authors off the top of my head. But they did a study where they had two offices and they gave one office complete autonomy over their work and they had the other office sticking with strict regimens of how the business usually operated. Mm. The problem is initially in the autonomy control area, like control, what is it sample in the in the office that had more autonomy there was a dip in productivity initially because everyone had to get used to the autonomy yeah. like if you can imagine an office that is used to having rules and regulations and strict ways of doing something it's going to take them a while to undo that and unlearn that behavior so initially there was a dip in productivity but then there was a huge spike that was like three times bigger than what the like slave driving office was so i think it's with the way our society works especially like if you think of politics people are only thinking of the changes they can make while they're in in a seat in like three years they're not thinking of the changes that would be better for the society better for the environment overall in the long term so businesses if they just know that there's going to be a dip in productivity initially they might be less likely to switch over to having more autonomous uh, processes you know yeah I hope this makes sense <laughs> getting a touch political there yeah um, I think a lot of conservation businesses and employers though hopefully they're a bit less uh, needing to have like revenues every quarter to report to investors and stuff well it's not investors it might be Usually. grants like, yeah you might have to do you, you when you apply for money and big grants you have strict timelines like you need to have this or like what is it called when you go out and you survey something and you take like a baseline data for what an area is like and then you have your like activities that you have to keep reporting every quarter to see how they go and then you need to do a final report and because the people that give you money want to know that the money has actually been used for intended purposes yeah yeah so i think it's it's a bit different it's not like you have kpis to hit or anything but it's like you definitely because a lot of conservationists don't have a steady stream of income they need to be showing and proving to the people who are like grant givers or the people who sponsor them they need to be showing that they're doing something with that money Mm. so i feel like there is still a lot of pressure especially because 
you have less money than a traditional business, so there's even more pressure to do all the right things. Yeah. So almost I think there's less freedom in the conservation jobs. And even like I've applied for jobs and even interviewed for jobs recently where it's like we can only employ you definitively for the next six months, possibly for two years, but we, that just depends if our funding gets approved. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a tough one. So it's not like the employers are slave drivers themselves. They're also they're under also the pump under hustling. The pump. Yeah, I think all conservationists are hustling. <laughs> <laughs> so it's hard. Like when there's such a big hustle culture... It's hard yeah. to instill that, like, m- good physical and mental health practices amongst your organization, I think. But I think after COVID, everybody's like, yeah, yeah, you can work from home sometimes. Like, people are understanding how flexible they can be if they need to be. Yeah. And it's, like, not that big a deal. Yeah. So maybe this is something that will help people with chronic illnesses it's if you've got your own setup at home, yeah. that's a lot more comfortable. You can make it exactly how you want it. Nobody Instead is... of working at an office where you're stuck with the shitty chairs and desks. Yeah. And maybe nobody's peeking over to see if you're having a rest. Like, you can just work <laughs> in your own time. Like, maybe this will be beneficial for people with chronic illnesses. Yeah. And I think, um, what, what can people like you and me do if we have colleagues that have chronic illnesses? So we've talked about what companies can do just be better for everyone (laughs) but i feel like we as people have to remove the competitive like what is it called a competitive persona from our work ethics and everything doesn't have to be a competition i feel like it would be really good if if you reached out to your colleagues more see if there's anything we can do to help because I feel like if people are just genuinely working together all the time, it doesn't matter if you have a chronic illness, mental health issues, having a shitty day. Mm. It's really nice to have people around you in your environment who will help and support you instead of just trying to climb the ladder faster than you. <laughs> I'm really just step sorry. On, step on your head. To... Yeah. Also, I'm really sorry if anyone can hear my stomach grumbling throughout this whole what? podcast. That's going to be really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah I feel like it's important so it's interesting that the solutions to helping people with chronic illness just seems to be we make things better for everybody in both instances like if you take it upon yourself to be a better friend a better colleague if your businesses take it upon themselves to make things more accessible for everyone in their business like it's just going to be better for everyone yeah, that's that's the goal. That's, yeah, that's the fantasy. The goal. Because then if like so if one in five people have a chronic illness, it's not like they have to be singled out to make things better for them. Like if it's so common by helping everybody, you're probably gonna be secretly helping a lot of people with chronic illness that you don't even know. Yeah. Yeah. So there we go. What have we learned today? That if we make workplaces and relationships, friendships, colleagueships more accessible, then it will just make a better workplace for everybody. Um, Thank you so much for being a part of this chronic illness episode. I hope you learned something. I sure uncovered a lot in this discussion. If you want to read both Annabelle and Roxanne's blogs, I will add them in the show notes. And if you want to check out the last season of the podcast, go do that. If you want to get my book, you can get it anywhere you get your online books. Um, our Instagram is at Lonely Conservationist, Twitter is at Lonely Conserve, and you can support our projects on Patreon at patreon.com slash Lonely uh, That's all for now, and I'll see you again in the next episode. Bye!